a little bit of understanding the larger context of the process is actually a creative commitment as well as a business reality. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips and strategies for running a more profitable and impactful purpose-driven architecture practice that lets you and allows you to do your best work more often. And if you're not already, if you haven't already come to work with us to implement the smart practice method, what are you waiting for? There's no reason to reinvent the wheel or do things the hard way. Get a shortcut so that you're not one of the firm owners who comes to me 40, 50 years down the road with little to show and unfortunately because they weren't willing to ask for help. Now, With that, let's roll into today's conversation. We have Nate McBride on the line today. Nate, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you, Enoch. Happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, it's interesting. You went to you went to Stanford for undergraduate, and then Yale for graduate. I don't see that very often. Going to Stanford, and you had an engineering degree. Uh, I did, only because the uh, architecture program uh, was kind of the poor stepchild of a bunch of different departments. And so did they have an architecture program at Stanford when you were there? They did. They did. And they, uh, it lasted for 10 years. Uh, they, I think two or three years after I graduated, they terminated it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was really a liberal arts program. It was not in any way pre-professional program. And it was, you know, kind of cobbled together pieces from the art, art history, you know, departments, the engineering departments. But at the time, the reason I ended up in the design, in the uh, engineering school is the mechanical engineering school there had um, an incredibly progressive, forethoughtful program called design thinking, and mm. that's that persisted even though the architecture program terminated. That sensibility persisted and has blossomed at Stanford, and it, you know it's sort of it's creative thinking for engineers ultimately. Uh, in application, mm. but but it's it's kind of uh, you know how to make how, how to think nonlinearly and broadly mm. about uh, about problem solving, and oh, so it that. ended up anyway. The architecture program sort of with no place to go uh, ended up in that program, which was really a great you know sort of philosophical umbrella for what for for an architecture program actually. Um, but there were ten yeah. people in the program. You know, I remember the. Uh, the director of the program who, you know, every, every teacher was part-time from San Francisco and, uh, mm. you know, practicing architects, which was not oh, wow. a bad thing. You know, it was a good thing yeah. in, in most ways. Um, but they weren't on campus. They would come down and, you know, have st- studios. But the head of the program uh, said to us when we started, there were 10 of us, uh, well, there are 10 of you here. Um, nine of you will end up, let's see, eight of you will end up doing something uh, unrelated to architecture, but not architecture. Two of you will probably be in architecture, and one of you will be a, you know, a, a, an actual architect in the way you conceive of architects, which was a sobering, mm. you know, a sobering entree to the program. But actually, in retrospect, I sort of value that in that that uh, that comment. I mean, I feel very fortunate when I reflect on that, that I'm, that yeah. I'm you know, lasted oh. for 40 years uh, doing what I do. You know, um, I, I wonder if, I wonder if professors <laughs> collaborate on that. Cause I know at Cornell university <laughs> when I, my, my, my very yeah. first day there, they had all of the freshmen there in the big room yeah. and Jaden Hall, or I can't remember where it was. And they kind of gave us the speech basically. They said, turn to the right, turn to the left. Uh, There's oh, a yeah, good yeah, chance yeah, that yeah. those people won't be there when, uh, there. when you graduate. <laughs> 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 and and for yeah. for good reason it's not yeah. like they've not like they failed out they went on yeah. to successful careers in other areas and used those yeah. talents in other areas and found that yeah. the direct application of architecture wasn't a fit for them yeah it wasn't a failure it was it was just it really a message that there's very little room uh you know what we yeah. do and and actually what we do is so has such a li- it's really unfortunate because it really points to the fact that what we do has such a limited uh, impact on the on the built environment and the natural environment. You know, architects. You know, I I don't know what the statistic is, but it's an incredibly small percentage of what we see every day in the built form. Uh, our response. Yeah, I think I think two percent is something I heard yeah. thrown around later yeah. recently. So it was more an indication of that than you know than the fact that people were incapable or un- unsuited for yeah. the profession. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you have so you have a, you have a firm of about twenty people, give or take. I think yeah. you're about seventeen to eighteen. Yeah, right around the hunts right, there. Right. Uh, you have enough awards to cover a couple rooms with with plaques. Um, you know, a highly awarded practice, doing a lot of great work. Focus on the residential niche uh, there in in Manhattan hmm. and across the, across the nation and even yeah. the world. Yeah, and we're you know it's it it's it's I have to pinch myself some days that that's that the description you just gave is is true and yeah. uh and you know coming up on 40 years seems unbelievable um so nate if i can if i can jump in there yeah. just because i love that and if you're sitting down with a, a young ambitious mm-hmm. architect who just looks at that career that you've built 40 years and and all the awards and building mm-hmm. a practice that is in all definitions successful and they're like you know i just want to I want to do that. There's something yeah. inside of me that says that I want to. I want to contribute in that way. What advice would you give them? Um, naivete is very important. <laughs> Check. <laughs> okay. I mean, well, there's a lot of people who end up completely failed out with naivete. Yeah, so yeah. okay, I get That's that. That's a start, though. Tell me what you mean. Tell me what you mean well, by naivete. Yeah. Why? Why would that be at the top of the list? So I'm just you know reflecting on. I was working after graduate school for Cesar Pelli. Um, when Caesar Pelli's office was quite small, and I think they were they were about the size of my office today. So, mm. um, and I remember walking to, and it was sort of an idyllic situation. You know, it was an emerging office at the time, and projects were just coming in, of massive scale projects that were, you know, yeah. international. Um, and I had the opportunity while I was there to also teach undergraduate at Yale, which was also incredibly gratifying. I loved, loved, loved it. In the same way that I love being able to talk to you, it was a moment of reflection, you know, ab- ability to step outside and look, look, you know, broadly at what I what I do. I learned as much as they did, obviously, in that in kind of teacher student interaction. But what appeared on the outside to be kind of from a resume uh, quality, um, a path to a life uh, was also not a path that I thought um, I had chosen. Which is is a little bit, you know, of uh, it, it 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 wasn't a proactive set of decisions that led me to this kind of amazing place, and it took me a little while to realize that I had not made the decision and and been honest with myself about the fact that I w- wanted to be on my own at some point. Um, and the naivete part <clears throat> was that I had, of course, no idea how to move from this kind of you know, kind of, uh, mad, uh, what's the right word, magical life that I had to what I finally discovered that I really wanted. And I don't think I would have, knowing what I know now about what I went through in the first years, I don't think I would have been as comfortable making that jump, that leap of faith. Yeah. So the naivete comes from not knowing, <laughs> not knowing what I was going to experience in a way, and being willing to, and be, and and being willing to embrace that actually, and to just accept that that that, that the unknown. So the, that what was the magical life you're referring to? The magical life was living, in, you know, a, an academic uh, community like New Haven, Connecticut, uh, yeah. working for you know. A prominent architect in a very small office where access to him and responsibilities were large um, and also teaching at Yale College I mean it was you know if that profile was uh, you know seems like a dream in, in you know to, to and, and should it was an amazing amazing time but it wasn't I realized what I realized was that, that after that I realized that I do did need to go out on my own, I started thinking about it and talking about it a little bit, um, I realized that the longer I waited, the more difficult it would be. So that's the other kind of comment I might make in terms of, you know, mm-hmm. not only was it important not to know how difficult it would be, but it was important to, well, it was certainly most important to believe that it was is what I wanted and what I had, you know, what I really had to do. And the other was to <clears throat> know that it was... <clears throat> Not so much um, a risk, because if I had known how much of a risk it was, I, I, you know, I would have been uh, anxious about doing that probably in retrospect. But the other thing is, I realized that if I didn't do it, the longer I waited, the more vested I would be, the more difficult it would be to, you know, to, to step out. 
Um, yeah. And so I had a conversation with this, you know, kind of esoteric architect who I was doing an article with named Raymond Abraham, uh, an Austrian architect. <clears throat> and he said, so when are you, um, when are you moving to New York? And I said, yeah. well, I don't have a job in New York and <laughs> I have a job in New Haven. And he said, well, why don't you go out on your own? And I said, I don't have any clients. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, in this kind of, um, uh, in like, you know, sort of e European intellectual uh, condes con condescension said, but being on your own is a state of mind. And I realized actually how powerful that was. At first, I thought that's just sort of, you know, more of the intellectual architect that I've you know lived with in school for so long. But I actually understood eventually what he meant, that it's 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 a matter of of inhabiting um, inhabiting what you <laughs> believe and, and what you want and projecting that to other, to others. Uh, that makes it happen. Uh, projecting that you're available, projecting that you're interested, projecting that you're engaged, and, and that you're moving forward in some way, and 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 it invites it invites clients. And that's what was the what was the pebble in the shoe, so to speak, from from working in the academic world that made that left you unsettled, that made you think that you know what I really got to do my own thing. Can yeah. you describe that to me? Help me understand that. Yeah, I think it was more less the academic part of it because I <clears throat> I didn't I think did always think of that as as kind of an adjunct nurturing kind of a parallel act, set of activities. Uh, and I kept teaching even when I when I did go on my own. I kept teaching for a number of years. Um, but I think it was more about um, having the agency that ultimately need, you know, that I felt that I needed to have personally. And oh, yeah, okay. and I think that's probably what kind true. Of agency, what kind of agency didn't you have at that time? I think it was certainly artistic agency um mm -hmm. but it was more i think it was deeper than that actually i think you know if i'm really honest with myself about that i was i think it was the need to sort of control the day to control the week mm -hmm. to control uh who i get to work with who i get to talk to and you know i suppose that's not a terribly great reflection on my needs you know psychologically that i needed that level of control but that's i think that deep down was the motivation yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you say you're still driven by that or do you think you've grown through that or where are you at oh, with that now? Oh my God, what a great question. Um, the uh, I was thinking um, <clears throat> before we got on together, I was thinking, um, and I know I said to you, what I love about this is I have no idea what we're going to talk about or what you're going to ask me. And I thought, what would, I did think for about two minutes, what would, what, what would Enoch ask me? Like probably something like, what was the most difficult, you know, <laughs> the sort of, you know, Tee it up question, kind of softball question in a way. We'll get there know, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the most difficult part of the 40 years you just went through? And, you know, the kind of expected response was the three recessions that we went through, right? That we mm. survived. And, and actually, I sort of jokingly always say, we're, you know, people say, well, gee, you have a successful practice. And I said, yes, we survived three recessions. That's the question. That's, yeah. that's, yeah. yeah. that's how low the bar is for success in architecture. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, the th the most difficult part was growing from six to twenty, oh, and what was and difficult just about that? Yeah, diff and to your to right to your question because um, that required at that up until that point I was able to maintain a level of control and understanding of virtually everything that was going on in the office for every project, yeah. and at a certain point I had to let go and trust the other people around me, and that was probably. Um, you know, given how I described why I ended up doing it in the first place, the most difficult part of the experience of, of creating and, and developing a firm. Um, yeah. Trusting. Well, what was difficult about that? So it's the letting go. That's, that yeah. is a very difficult juncture. Yeah. And that stops a lot of people about that five to six to eight yeah. to even 12 person level where they just yeah. can't get past it because yeah. they, they're never able to overcome that. Yeah. Yeah. For better, for worse. Right. For better, for worse. And, and yeah, probably, what allowed you to do that? And probably for Tell me worse. About that. What was that like for you? Oh, my God. It was, it was not <clears throat> a choice. Um, we happened to, uh, by a quirk of circumstance, get a, you know, a, a massive job um, 
which required that well several things happened simultaneously it was it just sort of rolled and, and it all happened in the last four years actually crazily enough um and not maybe not so crazily it's you know covid and the and the and the residential market are tightly aligned in my mind you know the the sort of time that people have spent at home the way they think about their homes has been different um the way where they think they want to live is different now um, so that, and, and, you know, parallel to that, the stock market there, you know, people's sense of liquidity was also growing as well as their sense of awareness of, of homeness or what it means to be alive <laughs> and not just, yeah. you know, going through, <clears throat> through the mill every day. Um, <clears throat> uh, but anyway, the difficult part of that, um, was foisted on me by getting a massive job that required, you know, more hundred million dollar project. So all of a sudden, you know, we were hiring just to scramble to get that organized wow. and together. Simultaneously, what was the project? Uh, it's it's a residential project that we can't, you know, reveal the, can't, <laughs> reveal disclose? the can't disclose the location or the okay. Client. So, but a pure residential, um, so residence, private residence, a private residence, a, pri a private yeah, Pieta wow. Terra, in fact, um, even create more insane than that. Um, but anyway, the, at, at the same time, we started getting uh, one after the other publish it, you know, p things published, um, and the the kind of convergence of those two uh, and and you know, all in the context of covid and the and the kind of general market for residential just growing exponentially that that led me to almost you know i just i just couldn't i you know i went in with the illusion that i could still do you know run the the run the office the way i'd run it for 35 years and it became clear that it it was not possible very quickly and so uh I think it was just a matter of, of, of kind of accepting and res, res, resignation. Like, this is the way it has to be. I have to figure out a way to do what I like to do within this context. I have to figure out a way to, um, a way to maintain the kind of quality and vision that I, you know, in, intend for the work but not be involved in the details. And that's been very, it's been very tricky for me. Really, really difficult. Um, it's required, it's just required, but I'm fortunate that I work with incredible people and, you know, and the, the, the level of trust is high to begin with. Some of those yeah, people. What do you find for me. you? What's the trickiest part about that for you? Um, the, well, I think it's that <laughs> the trickiest part, this is more as this is more of a psychological, uh, uh, question and answer but the trickiest yeah. part is not knowing what the client is going to be seeing and oh okay yeah you know i think i find the vulnerability yeah. of that difficult um because i have such mm -hmm. a personal connection to everything that's happening in the office and every project mm -hmm. um that you know i i want it to be the very best and i i and you know believing that it'll be if not the very best it'll be well, better than good enough that has been been difficult. The other difficult part of that is not having the personal connections with the clients as much as I did because I really was deeply engaged in in the f people and families that have you know designed homes for over the year. And now you know I have uh, you know lieutenants that you know actually speak to them and become friends with them in a way that I you know that kind of closeness and connectivity f is personally satisfying to me. But it's also the way that I the way that I understood how to design what we were designing, because as I, you know, as I've said to everybody in the office, you, we're not designing, you're not designing your own home and you're not going to wake up here in the morning and have coffee in this kitchen or on this porch or on this, in, you know, this is someone else's stage set to inhabit. It needs to be about their narrative, about the storyline of their life, not your life. And so to not have that, level of connectivity to the clients takes away from me one of the most uh, you know powerful vectors that I've used over the years to create the designs that we've we've been able to build um, that are so satisfying to the people that we build for you know mm. um, such that you know I think five years ago 75 percent of the jobs we had were repeat clients you know just because those relationships and the resulting yeah. designs from those relationships were so intimate and, and meaningful to to the people we work with 
So when you look back at your body of work, Nate, what would you say has been the most rewarding project or client relationship that you can share with us that stands out? <laughs> um, that's a great You don't need question. to mention names, but if you could describe yeah. the project or... Actually, oddly, um, there's there there. This is this sounds like I'm equivocating a bit. There's so many, and and they're all so sure different. And I think yeah. that's that's yeah. that's what's so fantastic about what we do. Each one of these things is so idiosyncratic. Each client is so different. Each place we build so different. And and as I was saying before, those are the things that that sort of. Uh, you know, define for us what the project is going to, how it's going to evolve over time. Um, So, and there are just so many engaging locations we've built on and so many engaging people, but I will say that actually, I'm I'm, I'm, going to pick one out. I'm just going to, which is an anomaly because parallel to doing these houses and having these kind of incredible intimate relationships with people and making homes for them, not just houses for them. Um, we have a practice that's maybe 10% in the art world. So we're, we do, you know, we've done galleries, studios for artists who, you know, have enough, <laughs> we're successful enough to afford an art today. Um, and also as a result of those projects, that is designing um, galleries in New York, we've made, you know, or I've made close connections with the gallerists, with the, you know, with the directors of these galleries, and they've become, to, they've come to rely on me to do uh, exhibition design for, mm. for some of their artists. So in some ways, as gratifying as it is to have someone I build a home for say to me at the end of the project, this is exactly what I want. This is exactly what I needed, but I had no idea it would look or feel like this. Um, or look like this. That is an incredibly gratifying moment. What's really wonderful about working with artists is that there's sort of an unspoken common language. Um, so mm, mm, a lot of mm, what we yeah. do in doing home is, is, is help people begin to understand that language and begin to become sensitized to it and begin to understand how the visual world or the, their environments affect them. Um, and that's a very, as I overusing the word, gratifying process to go through with our clients, um, because it becomes a, love, a process of self awareness and discovery for them. But all starting from the get go with an artist who understands the language, the basic language of light, space, form, movement, uh, the choreography of of space is is can be really really exciting, you know. And and that's yeah, that, must be, that's, that must be extremely you know, rewarding. It's really rewarding. And the corresponding yeah. uh, comment from the artist, of the, the, the most, you know, the, the highest accolade from a client, residential client, is this is exactly what I wanted, but I didn't know what it, that it was going to look like this. The, the corresponding yeah. one from an artist is, you made my art better. And, and I think that's the tie for those two things is that we are not at the center. We are creating the opportunities for experience and for others in their activities, whether it's living with a family or exhibiting in a museum, that make their life better. And, that, and, and I know that sounds rather trite, but that is, you know, that is a per- very particular stance of respect, of standing under and not overstanding, standing over uh, the process or, or the context uh, and letting the context inform and uh, inform what, what we do and make us kind of almost the conduits of an of uh, of an experience that that's mm. that's needed and hoped for or dreamed of. So, I love that. So they use the architecture to accentuate and highlight. It becomes a stage upon which people play. play yeah, their, their activities and we have to lives. understand the storyline. We have to almost write the storyline story for them yeah. sometimes. Um, now, speaking of storylines, I had I had a mentor once that told me that oftentimes our challenges can be the things that actually make us. So it's the a lot of times it's the it's the mm-hmm. challenging moments that really define us. Mm-hmm. And so what I'd like to ask you, Nate, is as you look back over these past forty years, almost forty years, coming mm-hmm. up next year of running a practice, there's there I'm sure there were some specific instances that that really mm-hmm. shaped you that were painful, some lessons hard hard mm-hmm. learned lessons that you learned. What comes to mind when you look at some of those 
challenges that that really shaped you that the the things that if you would have known about them you know the naivete mm-hmm. covered up the uh <laughs> <laughs> Um, that it's a business. <laughs> and mm. I think going back to what we were talking about before we got online, you know, on, on, yeah. on recording is, uh, yeah. you know, so many of us are trained to believe that we're pure artists and we don't sure. understand that we, and, and, you know, it, the, I'll t- the best, the best thing that happened to me in architecture school was somebody gave me a book. Of, and it had nothing to do with school. It was a, another student. Give me a book as a gift of all Louis Kahn's sketches. Oh, and wow. I looked through it, and they're horrible. <laughs> they're horrible. <laughs> Scribbles. They're scribble. I mean, it, it's not even you know, it's not even the aesthetic of the of the of them because they're kind of naively, you know, okay. alluring in some way. You know, they're okay. kind of like naive art. But yeah. but how badly the designs went for him so often. Yeah. And how much he struggled to get to these, what yeah. in the end, you know, these icons of 20th century architecture, which seems so pure, so simple, so direct, so clear. And yet he, 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 he stumbled his way into these things. And, and I think that um, along is sort of related to the, what I was saying about we don't understand that it's a business. I'm getting around to a larger point here. It's a little bit, I'm going to pull it together here, I think, I hope. But um, the, the fact is that that struggle is not clear to you as uh, clear to one as an architecture student. You know, it's as if Le Cabousier, you know, the, the, the paradigm is Cabousier went into a studio in the morning, did a little painting, then he did a little architecture, you know, in the afternoon, and it was all, you know, just, you know, like that. <laughs> and uh, in fact, you know, it might be that way for a few people in the history of architecture, but mostly it's a lot of, of, of struggle through and, you know, and, and discovery and a long learning process. So there's that. And then the idea that it actually is one's livelihood is never, ever discussed. You know, it, we, at least it wasn't when I went to school, you know, that this is actually um, more considered an avocation rather than, than a profession. That's, the, that's sort of the, the spirit that was imparted to us. And, and, it, and it was really unfortunate because it also engendered a sense of, of, of kind of egoism about <clears throat> architecture and about the process, which doesn't lend itself to the business of architecture in any helpful way, but more importantly, doesn't lend us to put us in a position to make good architecture which is kind of what I was trying to say earlier about, you know, really trying to deeply understand the context, meaning that those for whom we're designing their narrative, where they're building, how they, you know, all of that. If, if one comes from the top down, all of that is somehow obscured or at least framed in a way that serves the kind of a priori preconceptions that the master architect has. And that, that, is a, that is a disservice to the profession. It's a disservice to the people that we work for. It's, it's, it's not that we don't have vision and clarity. We do. But, but we're not, you know, we're, we're just, we're just the, the conduits of, of something. We're the great trip guides for those who are on their own path of discovery. And that is a great business model, uh, but it's actually a moral model. I think it's an essential moral model. Um, so this, the struggle though, is to become aware that you have to pay bills <laughs> back to your question. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, yeah, you, yeah let's, let's think about and, that just for a second. Yeah. Tell me about a specific story when you found they were really faced with that. So, I mean, I, yeah. you know, I can't, I can't really think of a specific, but I know when I started out, I had no money. I had no clients. Uh, yeah. I was drafting for other architects in New York. I had rented a desk for $75 a month. And I was living in a boarding house. <laughs> yeah, with, I started from the garage, the, so to speak. Yeah, with the uh, bathroom down the hall, literally, you know, kind of thing, place. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, um, and you know, I had uh, no idea that actually um, I had to, you know, I had no idea how to price what I did or how to organize payments or understand how, what my costs might be today or, to, you know, or going forward. I had no nothing. I had no no idea. It was completely the combination of faith and naivete again. It was 
back to that. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm thankful for that, but it was horrible. I went into great debt and, you know, didn't know quite how to get out of it. Um, kept struggling on and never give, for you debt, know, just did not Did you give take out up. credit lines? Was it bank lines? I had a credit was card. Cards? <laughs> I had a credit, credit card. I had a credit card. Yeah. Yep. Um, and what did you, what did you use the credit card to fund? Was it, was it software? Was it office expenses? Uh, anything. Dinner, yeah. <laughs> food, dinner. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, got it, got it. Living expenses. Uh, yeah, it was everything, and okay. it accumulated very quickly. Um, so that was sobering, um, and but it did lead me back to what I was talking about before. A little bit of understanding the larger context of the process is actually a creative commitment as well as a business reality. In other words, we have limited resources, and those limited resources are like the size of a canvas for a painter. And, you know, Mm -hmm. that defines, uh, already frames the end end result. That's where we're, you know, it's, it's, it's not an open ended universe. And I think, you know, that can easily go back to the things I've been talking about, which is understanding, um, you know, who the clients are that we're building for, where we're building and the idiosyncrasies of, of the environment we're working in, even, even the sort of, you know, restrictions and requirements of any agencies having jurisdiction become uh, a part of that. And and the fact that we have to do it efficiently enough to pay ourselves is actually not a negative thing. It's actually a positive thing, like these restrictions are by, you know, uh, zoning boards. They're actually not negatives. And the minute we think of them all as negatives, we're spending a lot of energy pushing against them, a lot of psychic and actual energy pushing against them. But if we take them all, including the being in a business, and embrace them as the as the, the vectors, the foundations of creativity, and not something adversarial, then we're making better architecture, I believe. We're making better architecture. And that includes being able to pay ourselves. And this is a long, um, a long, you know, set of thoughts in coming. Um, and <laughs> and a hard and a hard, a hard road getting to that realization, but those things are not negatives. They they are they are yeah. what we yeah. make things from. That's how we you know structure mm-hmm. the canvas. We create the canvas and then we paint it, paint the painting. Yeah. Um, and these are anyway. not conversations that we generally have in architecture. So we probably yeah. probably don't have these kind of conversations very often. I would imagine. No, 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 no. Which is which is so great to have today. Yeah. Thank you yeah. again. Yeah. You're welcome. What would be what would be the biggest kind of most impactful business move that you've made when you look back in terms of the business sense? Um, other than starting, <laughs> yeah, yeah, starting is a big other one. Than Got it. Yeah, yeah. Train. There you go. Check that box. Yep. Yeah, getting on a train in New Haven, Connecticut, and with a backpack and coming to Grand Central Station. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And uh, going to a payphone and calling a friend. I'm coming to New York to start a work <laughs> practice. Can I sleep on? <laughs> that was that was large. Um, I think that's a big uh, one. That's that, not to that be was underestimated. Big. That was big. I think I, yeah. everything yeah. else pales after that. I'm afraid. Um, well, let, let's pause there just for a second. Let's yeah. pause there just for a second because this is the thing that I've discovered in my own entrepreneurial journey, but yeah. especially those of our audiences who are li- listening out there. There is always going to be a moment. Uh, this mm-hmm. is my personal experience, and it sounds like mm-hmm. it was yours in this experience as well. There's a moment when you're standing at the edge of the cliff, cliff. and yeah. you have to make a decision. Yeah. Are you going to stay yeah. where you're at right. or are you going to jump? Yeah. And there's no amount of safety. There's no amount mm-hmm. of security. There's no amount exactly. of planning that is necessarily going to make that leap any less terrifying. You Fine. just have yeah. There's a part of you that has to pony up, that yeah. has to say, I'm doing this. Let's jump off. Get yeah. my backpack and fly, and fly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was so beautifully said, Nick. You know, that was exactly and so right. Yeah, beautifully yeah. described. Thanks. Yeah, it's the lead so that was faith. an impactful moment. So thanks for letting us just yeah. pause to really acknowledge that, which was yeah. you brought that up for a reason. That that is not to be understated. Yes. Like, like to really do that as a human being, to leave the comfort. Mm-hmm. This is something mm-hmm. that we don't oftentimes do as human beings yes. in any era of our life, in our fitness, in our relationships, in our right. relationship with the higher power, right. in, in our relationships, in our businesses. Right. Um, it's, it's uncommon. Yeah. And, it, it's, it's, it, and that fact speaks to the sort of prim- primal directive of, of the species, which is security and survival. 
You know, indeed, when you get down indeed. really down to it, it's just a basic evolutionary yeah. function. Yeah, and, that's right. And that's right. to be able to let go of that for a moment, even is is yeah. how we grow, actually. You know, in the end. So. You know, there's there's um, I don't know if you've ever taken any landmark courses or done any work with them. They're they're a great mm. group, but no. they they have a saying. Yeah. They have a story about. They always tell about when when you want to take action on something. They tell the story mm-hmm. about the uh, the the hat sellers in 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 England back in I don't know when it was hundreds of years ago. They would uh, they yeah. would come to a city so the hat vendors and they would they would throw their hat over the wall so to speak. And this is a uh, a uh-huh. term that John F Kennedy used when he talked about going to the moon, where they basically uh-huh. did that that they took that first step that they could not take back, and they were committed yeah. from that point forward. Wow. So, but the hardest wow. thing. Yeah was to actually throw the hat That's, over the wall. The hardest thing is to yeah. make that commitment mm-hmm. at the beginning. Mm-hmm. The hardest thing is for John F. Kennedy mm-hmm. to get on TV and say to the whole nation, mm-hmm. we will put a man on the moon. In 10 years. Yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. 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 Right. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. With the time the limit, even. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Talk about, talk about <laughs> right. nervousness, man. Yeah. That's putting yourself on the yeah. line. So that, that is definitely <laughs> a huge business move that you made. What would you say would be yeah. a second business move for you that, that was, that really uh, paid off? For sure, um, the, the experience that I just described to you when we grew from five to mm. virtually 20 in <clears throat> starting three years ago or four years ago. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I realized that I can't manage the project uh, anymore. Mm. And this, this is actually yeah. a, as powerful a realization as the leap of faith. I'm at, at the cliff. I must jump. Um, yeah. I must no fly. Kidding. No but let me oh, go ahead. there for a second. Nate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you? This is what I found too, which is crazy. That actually sometimes when we have more to lose, it's harder to make that leap because mm-hmm. we we have built yes. more, so we have more to lose. We want to protect it more. Totally. Like when you have a team, you had like a team of six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, and if you're gonna move ahead with a whole new level of doing things, you're gonna mm-hmm. risk everything yeah. that you created. Yeah. yeah. In the past. Right. The risk, yeah, the, the, the terrifying, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, yeah, right, it was terrifying, and so, but the 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 next most important thing I did, taking the risks initially, yeah, super, okay. super, you know, a given, powerful and important and, and necessary. But the second thing okay. was realizing and accepting that I couldn't do this all myself and that I needed help, and so I gave up, gave up, and gave in. And I hired, yeah. uh, I hired a manager, and oh. it, it turned out to be somebody who is an architect. And okay. uh, you know, I, f- I feel re- this was not the plan. I was actually just interviewing architects because we yet you know, it was very difficult to hire architects during the COVID. You know, everyone was so yeah. busy; it was impossible. So, yeah. it was con- even if I didn't need them that day, I was constantly interviewing people. And I ran across this guy who, for seventeen years, had run. Ralph Lauren's facilities uh, department, you know, where they're doing stores mm. in Singapore and mm. what, you know, all yeah. of them. So he was managing a large number of people and a large number of projects. And he had decided he was really done with corporate life and really was interested in the kind of smaller scale work that we do. Um, and, uh, but his management skills, I was listening to him talk about what he'd been doing. And I was, going, I, I, there was a moment where I could have said, that's not, you know, that's not for me. But mm, why is I, that? Well, that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for another project architect at the time. Okay, I wasn't really okay. looking Got for it. a manager. Okay. But the but I had, there was a moment which was the convergence of being open, and also realizing that I was sort of like Atlas, you know, crumbling under the weight of the world that I was trying to hold up. That made me allowed yeah. me to kind of say, I need him. I need him yeah. and I'm willing to give up uh, for a larger, uh, again, another risk, of course, as you said, it's a huge yeah. risk. I give up everything that I know and, and I'm familiar with and it's kind of working okay um, to to go to some place that I have no idea what it looks like even. You know, that's that's another that's the, that was the second leap of faith. That was the second standing at the edge. Um and hiring yeah. and hiring him was a fantastic thing. You know, it was, I'm sure it was amazing. Cheap. <laughs> it wasn't cheap, but it it, it, it <laughs> wasn't cheap. It wasn't cheap, but but um but you know, daily I appreciate the uh the results of that. You know. 
um, the quality of my life, the quality of my uh, my ability to spend more time doing, you know, less worried about a lot of the things that make the office run and make the each project yeah. Yeah. efficient. Um, so I work directly with him, and then he works directly with the project managers now and the project architects. So anyway, that yeah. was a huge, and, huge shift. Okay. Huge. So do yeah. you right now in the practice do you do you track things like profit margin, profit per project? How do you do, do it more organically? How how detailed are you on that kind of stuff? We've struggled for years to do a good job at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, not uncommon. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and I, you know, there's not a lot of. Um, it's certainly not something one learns when you're working in another office. Um, yeah, and uh, the resources, other than you know, um, organizations like yours, are, are few and far between. Um, are are not even really known so yeah, yeah. i think it's yeah. all by try it's all by trial and error for years and years and years i mean our whole you know sort of standard agreement is a, is you can track back each term in the agreement to a specific problem we had on a job <laughs> exactly it's you know grown I mean? over time yeah that's typical yeah, yeah. yeah. we're not yeah. Gonna, we're not going to get into that yeah. situation again so that that be yeah, that's so, right. uh, so you can sort of see the history of our our learning by 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 stumbling um, in, yeah. in our agreement. I see a mental image agreements. of you, you know, answering that email and then being kind of frustrated and then going back over the contract, pulling it up in Word, yeah, yeah. putting in it's, a couple new a, line breaks and then typing in a new, <laughs> typing right. a new clause it's there. A, literally, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but eventually we kind of figured out how to kind of, you know, we definitely figured out uh, not by any training or by any other you know, outside third party, but just kind of figured out how to analyze our own profitability or loss in a particular job. Um, But what we had trouble doing was projecting that at the beginning of the job and then creating that kind of constraint that I was talking about, that frame for the painting at the get-go of the project and having the people managing the project or working on the project aware of that. And, you know, I'm very quick to tell everybody, This is not a perfect uh, structure because there are going to be times when you know that the longer term, it could be short term gain to do something less, spend less time on something. But of course, you have to have the judgment to know that the the impact later of spending more time now on both the outcome and the efficiency of the project is also to be considered when you're, you know, structuring Mm -hmm. your time. Um, but we finally got, to, thanks to the you know the person I just described, who we hired uh, you know a year and a half or two years ago. Um, we now have projections set up that are very, very clearly set expectations for everybody. Um, there's nothing punitive about not making them, but it is opportunities to also understand how we can do things better. As soon as we see that things are running over, that's a sign for us. Like why why is that happening? It's not just, oh, you've gone over. It's what it's a conversation Um, and it's a learning opportunity that we didn't have before when when we didn't have the clarity of those projections for each job. Why did it take us? What's next for McBride Architects? Oh, my gosh. That's a great question. You're killing me with these. Um, Well, I'm now 70. (laughs) A young 70. Great. Oh, my God. Uh, So I'm. And now I have an incredible group of people who are, who, and by the way, I want to talk about one of the beauties of, of, of letting go in this, in this second jumping off the cliff, um, which led to, you know, giving over responsibility and agency to other people in the office. Their ability to grow as a result of that structure has been huge. So people are stepping into the void. And I realized that, as a sole proprietor, I kind of sucked the oxygen out of the room for quite a long time. I didn't leave a lot of space for others to grow. And even though I gave lip service to that, often saying the most important thing about uh, an experience as an employee is to have the, have the feeling that every day you're learning something, something new, mm-hmm. I wasn't personally allowing that to happen. And so uh, now they've grown, you know, I can see in, in real time the growth that's happened by and, the, and, and, and eventually they're going to decide whether to take over or not. I mean, I think that's the next yeah. thing. 
really. Yeah, is, do they want to? Do they want to take over the practice, or do they don't? It's, I have no vested interest either way. I'm going. I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. be around okay. Okay. <laughs> to see yep. what happens. Yep. <laughs> doing what you're doing. Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but. You know, that, I think that's probably the next question for us as a business. Okay. How do we make that transition to, you know, more of a shared, uh, uh, you know, ownership and, and, not, and, and not just shared management, but shared ownership. The next phase, uh, the next cliff. Yeah. Yeah. The that's next a cliff. cliff. Yeah. yeah. Well, Nate, thank you for being here on the business yeah. of architecture today. It's been, we've just scratched the surface probably what we could have in terms of your expertise, your experience, what you've accomplished over the past 40 years and Mm -hmm. uh, the team you've built. So, you know, congratulations on building a team, making that switch from Mm -hmm. sucking the air from the room, so to speak, to (laughs) empowering people. And and that's what we're all about. Empowering people. Yeah. Yeah, Empowering people is huge. Yeah. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.